Good evening, everyone. It's so good to see you. You stand with us as we open up in prayer. We were talking in the back about how it's time to jam for the Lamb. You guys ever heard that? Worship the Lord with all our heart. So let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you, God, so much, Lord, for this opportunity to be able to gather together midweek, Lord. Um, God, just to be able to, to put everything at your feet, Lord, to be able to fall upon your feet um, as your sons and as your daughters, God. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would inhabit the praises of your people, Lord. We pray that you would cleanse us of any unrighteousness, Lord, that we might walk in with, we might carry, Father. And, Lord, that you would teach us through your word, God, supernaturally, Lord, so that we don't leave the same way that we came in, that we would leave refreshed, that we would leave taught, that we would leave encouraged by you, Lord. So we just thank you now, Lord. And as we worship you, Father, we pray, God, that you would um, help us to keep our eyes on you, Lord, that we wouldn't look to the left, to the right, behind us, but that we would look up and that we would sing of how good you are, Lord. So we thank you and we praise you, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship.
I will trust and I will trust in you. I will not be moved. High on the mountains, I will be lifting my voice and in the valley. We'll be dancing for joy in every season. You are worthy in every moment. You're wonderful. You're wonderful. You're wonderful. You're wonderful. Good evening. How's everyone doing? Well, if you guys want to take a seat, you can. If you want to stay standing, you can as well. probably introduce this young lady real quick because you guys are probably wondering who's that that's a friend of mine from another church i go and help their church once in a while and i just asked her if she wants to come out another guy was supposed to come too but he's sick so couldn't make it but she came so that's cool but her name is sophia would you guys just give her a warm welcome
But you have been so, so good to me. When I fell no worthy, you paid it all for me. Cause you have been so, so kind to me. places broken and scattered your mercy gathers mended and whole empty
So strength of God, so go before and lift me up, and as a way, oh, as a God, I look upon thee, my side. the way
You're my defense by my side as the breath, breath of God fall upon. Bring me peace, bring me Amen. You may be seated. You know, isn't it awesome that, that we serve a God who, whose promises are true and what he says in his word will come to pass? You know, in, in, in Romans uh, 8, 20, it says that that all things will work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. So no matter what you're going through, whether you're in the valley, where you're going through a, a trial, God is working and God is working things for good and ultimately he's he's going to do a good work in in all of our lives so be encouraged be encouraged that god will not leave us and and he's going to continue doing that work and it's amazing that we could uh serve a god who who we could look forward to the, the the final product we eventually will be perfected in him amen uh we want to just uh remind you just to keep uh the Alvarez family in prayer, and Nadine, um, God's doing a work there, you know, and, and whatever, whatever, which way it turns out, it's going to be for good, and we need to trust in that. We just got to keep them in prayer, that they continue to be encouraged and be strengthened through it. Uh, also, we want to keep, um, the, there's a, a team going out uh, to Kern, uh, Kern River this weekend for camping. There's a lot of families going, I believe about 100, so we want to keep them in prayer that they'd be safe, and they, of course they would have a, a sweet time of fellowship. I got some, we got some announcements, uh, just a few. Um, just to remind you, the Singles Ministry um, meets the second and fourth Monday of each month. Uh, that's at 7 p.m. in uh, room two, and they're going through the book of Ephesians. So you singles who feel led to be a part of that, yeah, you're welcome to that. Um, the upcoming men's retreat, September 15th through the 17th at Twin Peaks, it's a blessing that we've already filled up. We got actually about 52 guys. So anybody else 
that would like to be a part of it, we're starting a wait list, so you could still sign up, and if there's cancellations, and there's always cancellations toward the date, um, you know, you could be on the wait list. So if you're still interested, we'll have a, a sign up uh, for on a waiting list for that. Uh, and that cost of that is $180, with a $40 deposit, but the balances will be due August 27th. The Harvest Crusade uh, is this weekend, and that's uh, uh, Friday, uh, the 18th through Sunday, the, uh, August 20th at Anaheim Stadium. Gates open at 5 p.m., and the crusade begins at 7 p.m. So we encourage you to pray and invite an, uh, any unbelieving friends or family members to attend with you. That's what it's all about. You know, we invite people to these crusades, and people get saved. And uh, along those lines, with people, the new believers that we coming to Christ through the crusade, we have this uh, follow-up ministry that, that we're encouraging you guys to be a part of uh, for the, do the callbacks on people who have come to Christ in that crusade. Uh, there's going to be probably about 150 to 200 be, uh, new believers that are assigned in this area. And it's about just calling them and just welcoming them to the family of God and just uh, just praying with them, encouraging them, and just uh, even inviting them to Calvary Chapel Almani. It's important to get connected with the church when you first come to Christ, isn't it? So it's a good ministry, and, and we're excited to see what the Lord's going to do through that crusade. Um, those of you who are part of the Servant Leaders class, uh, the next class is August uh, 27th at 2 p.m. in room 2. So all are still welcome to join us as well. You, you don't have to have been going all along, but you are welcome to be a part of that. And just to remind you, we have this 24-7 prayer. Uh, we would like to pray around the clock throughout the month of August. If you would like to join us uh, by uh, committing to pray for half an hour, Every day you could sign up. There's slots that you could sign up, and it's for half an hour praying. And and we want to continue that through the month of August. Um, and that's there's power behind that prayer, right? And we cover 24 hours. God's going to move powerfully. So if you haven't signed up and you feel led to do that, there's a sign up list uh, in the back. But let's bow our heads and pray. Lord God, we we just thank you, Lord, that you are a God who is so faithful. In our lives, Lord, we thank you that by your Holy Spirit, you move, you move in a powerful way, Lord. And we ask that tonight, Lord, that you do move in a powerful way in the hearts of your people, Lord, as, as, as the word is, is brought forth, Lord, that, that it take deep root in, in, in the hearts of the people here, Lord, that, that we have open hearts to receive, Lord, and, and allow it to transform us, Lord. And we know that you know where we're at. And we ask that you just meet us, Lord. And we ask that we be encouraged tonight, that we be strengthened. And that we continue just to allow your spirit to move in our lives, Lord. We do lift up Nadine and the Alvarez family to you, Lord. We ask that you continue to allow your uh, Holy Spirit to comfort them, to strengthen them, Lord. To reassure them, Lord, that you are going to work things for good, Lord. And we ask for continued wisdom on the doctor's side, Lord. And we just ask that you perform a miracle if that's your will, Lord. That's the desire of all of our hearts, Lord. So we entrust her to you. And we also uh, lift up the families that will be going on, ca on camping to, uh, this weekend, Lord. That you just put your hedge of protection over them. And that they have a sweet time of fellowship, Lord. That, that they uh, just uh, bond together, establish new friendships, Lord. And, and just bring them back safely to us, Lord. In Jesus' name.
so I'll stand. sing out that truth, Lord. We lift our hands to you, Lord. We surrender everything over to you, God. We thank you again for your presence, Lord. And God, I pray for each person here, Lord. God, tonight, Lord, that we wouldn't get ripped off, Lord, of what you want to share with us, what you want to say to us tonight, God. We thank you for your grace, Lord. We thank you for your love for us, God. And we just ask that you would have your way with us tonight, Lord. I pray for all distractions, the enemy just to be gone from this place, Lord. Because we want to hear from you, Lord. That's why we're here. We're not here because this is what we do on Thursdays or this is what we're about. But God, again, well, this is what we're about. But again, that we're just not here and, and just repetitious. This is what we do on Thursdays and Sunday. Lord, we're here because we want to know more of you and we want to become more like you, to be Christ-like. So we thank you, Lord, and we praise you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Together we all agreed and said, amen. Before you guys take a seat, why don't you turn to each other and say good evening. Well, so cool to see you guys tonight. How's everybody doing? Doing good. Um, prayer requests also we got from, uh, some of you guys know Gio and Jasmine. Um, anyways, Jasmine's grandfather is in the hospital. And uh, I think he's an Arcadia Methodist. Um, he went into a surgery. He never woke up. He, we don't know if he's a Christian. It doesn't look like he is. And so they asked if we could keep him in prayer. And so let's do that tonight. Lord, we thank you for allowing us this day. Lord, that we can worship, that we can talk, we can pray to the living God. And Lord, lift up any request and know that you hear and you move and you're so gracious to respond, Lord. And we just pray together as a congregation that you would have mercy on, on this man, Lord, that he would not die in his sins. Lord, that he would, Lord, have that opportunity, Lord, 
and that you would have mercy on him so that he would wake and receive Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, Lord. And so we pray for him physically, Lord, that you would touch him and give everyone involved in his uh, life, Lord, that wisdom that he needs, Lord God, to recuperate. But we pray more than anything else, Lord, that you would touch him, Lord, physically, emotionally, spiritually, Lord, and that he would rise and be strong for you and your glory. Be with Jasmine, be with Gio, be with everyone involved. And Lord, even tonight, Lord, as we study your word together, we pray that you would teach us your word because we believe your word is the truth. Your word is the living word. It's the working word, Lord. It's the foundational truth upon which your church lives. And we need to hear your voice tonight. Bless your beautiful people. Lord, we pray, and if there is anyone here who doesn't know you, who's not yet a Christian, I pray that tonight they would know the love that you have for them, and they would yield their heart and surrender and become that son, that daughter of God that you called them to be. Breathe life, Lord, tonight. We pray, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Cool. Cool. Well, if you have a Bible today, let's open up to Job chapter 29. As we continue our journey through the Bible, this has actually been a, a tough task, really, to teach you the book of Job, but you guys got to know it's our conviction here at Calvary Chapel El Monte just to teach through the Bible, and so what we do is we start in Genesis, and we go all the way through Revelation. We don't just teach what we want to teach. We don't just teach topical lessons. We teach expositionally through the scriptures so that we would receive the full counsel of God. And the book of Job has been a tremendous blessing uh, to me because what it is is it teaches us that life, man, it's going to hit you hard. It's going to knock you down. The key is don't stay down. The key is to know that even in the, the calamities and the tragedies of life, that God will take those things and he will transform them into victories. We have to keep our eyes on the Lord and we must trust him no matter what comes our way. Uh, Jesus said about Peter, I prayed for you that your faith would not fail. And at the end of the day, that's the most important thing, that no matter what you go through, your faith would not fail. You would die in faith, believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we have to trust him. I read a story about a little boy who was about to go swimming at the local pool in the park. But before he went swimming, he approached a lady that he saw there sitting on the bench, and he asked her a series of questions. So the little boy goes up to the lady, and he says, excuse me, ma'am, are you a Christian? She said, as a matter of fact, I am. He asked her, do you read your Bible every day? And she said, yes. Do you pray every day? She said, yes. Do you go to church each week? And she said, yes. And then the little boy, he reached into his pocket, and he proceeded to ask her one last question. Will you hold my dollar while I swim? And, and see, the reasoning was he figured if she had a relationship with God, he could trust her. And that's probably wise. There's a bit of wisdom in the little boy's part. But we need to know even more than that, that not just trusting those who have a relationship with God, but trusting God, that we can trust God with our life. You know, one of the things that trips me out about God, and I don't know if you ever thought it through, but man, he can take sometimes even our wrecks, even our wretchedness, even our failures, and he combines that, the ways of men, with the wiles of the devil. And, and you wonder, can he take the ways of men and combine it with the wiles of the devil? And, and, you, and you wonder, can anything good come out of that? The ways of a man and the wiles of the devil, and you wonder, and the answer is yes. You want to know why? You might wonder why. It's because he's wonderful. Some of you guys here, you messed up in your life. You want to know something? God is going to use your testimony to minister to others, people that I could never minister to because you've been down that very road they've been on. I'm not saying take sin lightly. Don't get me wrong. But I am saying that God is an awesome God, and where sin abounds, grace abounds that much more. And we got to know that. You know, we have to understand as we go through life 
that we can trust him. So in Job chapter 29, we're going to cover two chapters tonight, Lord willing. Uh, the phrase that pops out is, oh, that I were. Oh, that I were. And he's longing for the past. Any of you guys ever hear think about that? The good old days. I remember what it was like. He's longing for the past. But then in chapter 30, he is despising the present. He's saying, but oh, now things are so bad. And what ends up happening is Job begins to struggle. And so let's start reading in Job 29 in verse 1. It says, Job further continued his discourse. And he said, oh, that I were as in months past. Here we see he was longing for the past. He wanted so desperately to go back in time before the terrible trials and awful adversities. You know, just in case you're wondering how long this whole thing went down, he says right there in verse 2 that it was probably just months ago. And so he's going through this thing, not just days, not weeks, but period of, of months. And as he's there, he wants to go back. Look what he says in verse 2 again. Oh, that I were as in, in months past, as in the days when God watched over me, when his lamp shone upon my head, and when by his light I walked through darkness, just as I was in the days of, of my prime, when the friendly counsel of God was over my tent, when the Almighty was yet with me, when my children were around me. And, and you know, there will be days as Christians when you don't feel your faith. You don't sense the spirit. You know, times are troubling. Like Job, you feel like the light of the Lord has been taken away. The, the days are dark. It doesn't make sense. They're bleak. They're black. And you just want to go back to the times when things were nice and hunky-dory. You know, we, we got to be so careful. We need to be careful that we don't live in the past. Remember what Paul Apostle said, Philippians 3.13, forgetting those things which are behind. And let me tell you something here. I don't care who you are, what you've done. God has an amazing future for you. He wants to work in you like you wouldn't believe. He wants to th work through you. He wants to use your life if you would yield to him like you would not believe. But what can get in the way a lot of times is when we focus on the past. And so Paul the Apostle, even after 30 years of ministry, he said, forgetting those things which are behind me. Not looking back to the hurdles he cleared or the hurdles he knocked down. You know, and, and so that's what Job is trying to do. He wants to go back to the past. We need to be careful. I heard one person say you can't start the next chapter of your life if you keep rereading the last one. We need to be careful with that. You know, I, I even think for my, to myself, to be honest with you, man, the early days when I first became a Christian, it was so amazing. The first uh, day that I got saved, the Lord came into my life. He lifted me up off the ground. I was walking with my head in the clouds. It was just amazing. I sensed the presence of God perpetually. It never went away. It overwhelmed me for two straight weeks. And so, you know, you, know, you want to go back. Uh, some people will look at Calvary Chapel and they say, well, remember the early days when, you know, Pastor Raw would say when they would get off the 405 freeway, they could just, once they got off the freeway, they sensed the presence of the Holy Spirit. I mean, just so amazing what God has done in the past. And we appreciate that. But you guys, man, God has a future for us. You know, we need to be careful that we don't live in the past. You know, we have a, a, a lot of people that would want to burn the past. I'd rather learn from the past, right? Just don't yearn for the past. I think that's the way it works. So how many of you guys messed up in the, in the past? Just out of curiosity. All right. Have you learned from your mistakes? That's what we're supposed to do, right? I mean, don't burn it. Learn from it, but don't yearn for it. Job just wants to go back. You know, he says right there, in, in the days of my prime. In the days of my prime. So how old do you guys think that is? How many of you think it's 18 years old? That's prime time. How many of you think that? You know, 20s, 30s. Um, and in case you're wondering what prime means biblically here in the original language, it's not necessarily in reference to younger years. Otherwise, he would have used a different Hebrew word. It actually means maturity. That's prime time for the Christian. Some of you guys here, 
You're, you're not even Christians. You need to get saved. You're going to go to hell. Some of you guys here, you are Christians, but you're immature Christians. And you haven't reached really that place of maturity, that place of being prime, as a matter of fact. Uh, did you guys know that Job was probably about 70 years old when all this happened to him? And when I think of 70 years old, uh, I think of what they call the golden years, huh? How many of you guys are right around there? No, you probably don't want to raise your hand, huh? <laughs> you know, 60 and up, right? And that's the golden years. And it, it means when you reach a place in your life where there's meaning and maturity. Job, you know, talks about wanting to go back to that, 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 that prime time. He also mentions something interesting there in verse 4. He mentions the time when there was the friendly counsel of God. And the King James Version translates that the secret of God. And, and basically what he's saying was there was a day when God spoke to me personally, when God spoke to me intimately, when I heard his voice loud and clear. How God led him personally and even how God led him secretly. You know, and thank God for his word. We have this uh, revealed truth to us. It's the same to everyone. And here's really, you know, the anchor for us when it comes to our life as Christians. But I do believe in a personal relationship that we can have with God. And when you pray, when you're seeking him, he will tell you things that, you know, you otherwise would have never heard. You will hear the secret voice of the living God. You know, the Bible talks about that frequently. For example, in Psalm 25, verse 14, it says, The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him, and he will show them his covenant. Proverbs 3.32, it says, The perverse person is an abomination to the Lord, but his secret counsel is with the upright. You know, John 15, 15, Jesus said, no longer do I merely call you servants for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all things that I heard from my father. I made known to you, you know, and, and just out of curiosity, you know, you guys ever tell secrets to anyone? You ever go up to someone and you say, you know what? I need counsel. Do me a favor here. Don't tell anybody what I'm about to tell you, but I want to confide in you. I want to tell you something important. Well, when you enter into a deep and personal and intimate relationship with God, when you get on your knees and you start to pray, it's not just you telling God what to do. It's him telling you what he's going to do. He told Hannah, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to take your son and I'm going to make him the leader in Israel. Hannah learned that is a secret that came to her heart. And we see that throughout the scriptures and we see that in the in the life of Job. But, but now it was silent. Now Job couldn't hear the voice of God. He, he missed that voice. And then something else in verse 5, notice what we read right there. It says in verse 5, far be it from me. I'm sorry, verse 5. When the Almighty was yet with me, when my children were around me. And so you guys know, huh? All 10 of his children died, right? I mean, he wanted to go back and, Lord, the days that when my kids were there. I mean, wouldn't it be kind of cool? How many of you here would be, we think it would be kind of cool to have like a time machine? Time machine, you know, you can go back. Sometimes I want to go back to my high school days. Go back and maybe I would have tried harder or something, you know? Or I want to go back, you know, and just figure out, hey, what really happened right there, you know, when Shelly asked me out? I mean, I want to just kind of go through that <laughs> whole thing again, you know, or I don't know, you relive something, you know, go in, in the, in, I don't know. Job says, I want to go back, and this is very, very understandable. I want to go back to when my kids were alive. That's what he's saying right here. You know, some of you have suffered the loss of a child, and I can't even begin to imagine what that would feel like. To be honest with you, today when I was in my office just thinking about this, how someone's child dies, I just started crying. I started crying, and that was just me thinking of it. You know, and there's an infinite difference between imagining it and experiencing it, and that's where Job was. And it wasn't just one child, it was ten. And it was, all ten of them died in the same day. It's understandable, his desire, huh? 
Oh, that I were in months past. Look at verse 6. He says, when my steps were bathed with cream and the rock poured out rivers of oil for me. You know, when you look at Job, he was blessed with kind of like a buttery cream. That's the way they had back then. It it was for his feet. It was considered a luxury. You guys have it now, huh? We use cream all the time for our hands. Well, back then it was a luxury. And, you know, man, I wish I could go back. And I had the cream for my feet right here. It speaks of the oil in this rocky ground. And basically in those days, we know that olive trees thrived in rocky soil. And the uh, olive presses were there, you know, carved out into the rock. And so, you know, Job was saying, I wish I could go back to those days. When I, when I had the, the oil, I was spoiled by that, right? I mean, he wanted to go back. He was blessed with the Lord, with the maturity, with family, with luxury. He was a prominent man in the gates of the city. Look at, at verse 7. He says, may my enemies, I'm sorry, Verse 7, when I went out to the gate by the city, when I took my seat in the open square, the young man saw me and hid, and the aged arose and stood. The princes refrained from talking and put their hand on their mouth. The voice of nobles was hushed, and their tongue was stuck to the roof of their mouth. When the ear heard, then it blessed me, and when the eye saw, then it approved of me. You know, I mean, Job wants to go back, and it's understandable. You know, Job wasn't just a judge at the gates. He was esteemed by the people. He really was. You know, I don't know. I'm definitely dating myself here. A lot of you were not born yet, but I I remember the commercials of a a, a firm uh, called E.F. Hutton. You guys remember those E.F. Hutton commercials? And they conducted these aggressive advertising campaigns in the late 70s and early 80s, right? And so the E.F. Hutton commercials, what they did, they showed people like jogging or they're aboard a train or they're at a dinner party, some were even a sword fight, right? And uh, the conversation would eventually turn to the stock market, and that's when one person would say to the other, my broker is E.F. Hutton, and E.F. Hutton says, and then there was a silence. It was like an incantation, you know? I mean, there would, the joggers would halt in mid-stride. The commuters aboard the train would put down their newspapers. The dinner guests literally would stop in mid-air from passing the green bean casserole. Even the clanging swords would stop. Everything came to a screeching halt for everyone wanted to hear the advice of the legendary sage E.F. Hutton. And the commercials, if you remember, they ended with that same tag when E.F. Hutton talks. People listen, right? And that's kind of what it was with Job. And it wasn't just an artificial commercial. I mean, it was genuine. I mean, when he spoke, you could hear a pin drop. That was his life, family, luxury, intimacy with God. He was esteemed by men, maturity. There he was in the gates. You know, the Bible said in Job chapter 1, verse 3, this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. And it wasn't just because he was eloquent or wise that they listened to him. It was because he was compassionate and just. He would not be bribed by the rich. Look at verse 12 of Job 29. It says, because I delivered the poor who cried out, the fatherless and the one who had no helper, The blessing of a perishing man came upon me and I caused the widow's heart, think about that, to sing for joy. I put on righteousness and it clothed me. My justice was like a robe and a turban. I was eyes to the blind. I was feet to the lame. I was a father to the poor and I searched out the case that I did not know. I broke the fangs of the wicked and plucked the victim from his teeth. Then I said, I shall die in my nest and multiply my days as the sand. My root is spread out to the waters, and the dwell the dew lies all night on my branch. You know, here Job is basically saying that he wasn't listened to simply because he was eloquent. It's because he was a righteous man. He was a just man. You know, the poor and the fatherless. 
You know, the one who had no help, that's the one who had no lawyer. Now it is nowadays, you go to court, if you don't got a lawyer, you're in big trouble. Job says, I was the one who helped them, the poor and the fatherless, and the one who had no helper. You know, Solomon said something similar about that righteous ruler in Psalm 72, 12. He said, for he will deliver the needy when he cries, the poor also, and him who has no helper. You know, in verse 13, the New Living Translation says, I help those without hope, and they bless me, and I cause the widow's hearts to sing for joy. In verse 14 right here, Job mentions righteousness and justice. And how important that is, huh, for us as people of God, but especially the judges that rule, right? Uh, I remember a long time ago, not that I'm looking back to the glory days, okay, but a long time ago, we used to sing that song based on Psalm 89, verse 14. It says, righteousness and justice are the foundations of your throne. That's God's throne. That's who Job was. And, and basically what we're doing, you guys, what we're seeing right here is we're just seeing the, the life, the amazing life that Job had. In verse 15, he cared for the blind. He carried the lame. Job, uh, verse 16, he searched out the cases, you know. If someone comes up, they got a situation. Didn't matter if they were strangers. Bottom line is, he was a model man. He was an awesome example. And the Bible says in Proverbs 29, 7, that the righteous considers the cause of the poor, but the wicked does not understand such knowledge. And a lot of times, you know, when you get certain guys and they're, you know, they, they're good and they love the Lord, Sometimes those guys are, are not as strong, maybe even a little wimpy. Job wasn't like that. In verse 17, man, it, look what it says again. It says he breaks their teeth. I mean, you know what, man? That guy right there is trying to devour the poor. I am going to sock him. I'm going to rescue that person from his mouth before he gets devoured by the system. That was Job's heart. He didn't allow the rich or the greedy to devour their wick victims. It was a good life. It was a, it was a great life. I mean, he was rich. He was righteous. And here's the thing, okay? He thought for sure that because he was living that life, here's the thing, that he was going to cruise. He was just going to cruise all the way home. That he was going to cruise to victory, right? I mean, Look at, at, at verse 18 again, if you would. This is an important verse. Then I said, I shall die in my nest and multiply my days as the sand. In other words, uh, as the New Living Translation puts it, he says, I thought surely I will die surrounded by my family after a long, good life. You know, and, and that, that kind of makes sense, right? I mean, this guy's a blessing. This guy is being blessed. He's living according to the Word of God before the Word of God was even printed. I mean, he's an amazing man. I mean, again, in verse 19, it says, My root is spread out to the waters, and the dew lies all night on my branch. My glory is fresh within me, and my bow is renewed in my hand. No, again, men listened to me and, and waited and kept silence for my counsel, and after my words they did not speak again, and my speech settled on them as dew. They waited for me as for the rain, and they opened their mouth wide as for the spring rain. If I mocked at them, they did not believe it, and the light of my countenance they did not cast down. I chose the way for them and sat as chief. So I dwelt as a king in the army, as one who comforts mourners. Now, maybe, maybe you've read the book of Job before. And you're like, yeah, I know, I know, I've, I've read it before. Do, do, you, do you really, have you really learned, have you really studied how great this man was? I mean, we see that here in this chapter. It really is amazing. It's, you know, this guy with his roots so deep, they're spreading out all the way to the perpetual supply of waters. I mean, he was a guy with blessings from above. I mean, it talks about the dew. 
You know, better than Mountain Dew, right? It's the Master's Dew. I mean, just blessings from above. That was his life. Really, you know, one of my favorite uh, verses in the Bible is Psalm chapter 1, verse 3. Job is the poster child for that verse, where the Bible says, He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall prosper and not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Same truth over in Jeremiah 17, 7 through 8. You know, I mean, this guy was fresh. He was strong. He was healthy. He was respected, and understandably so. You know, when you look at this section right here in verse 21 and forward, Job is probably indicting his friends who were miserable comforters. The Bible says in Job 16, 2. And Job said, I'm, I'm, I'm not like you guys. When I went and counseled people, when I lectured them, they listened. You know, verse 23, it says, they long for me to speak as people long for rain. They, they drink my words like a refreshing spring. You know, verse 24, it makes more sense than the NLT. It says, when they were discouraged, I smiled at them, and my look of approval was precious to them. You know, you go to someone, and you want to encourage them. They're down. Job was saying, when I went, man, I... I I was upbeat, I smiled, I tried to share with him words of encouragement. You know, verse 25, he says, Job was the chief who chose the best for the mourners. And he was not like most kings, because most kings, they, they take their authority and they, they, they use it for their own um, benefit. But in verse 25 here, he says that as a king, I fought. For their comfort. And so, you know, that's what he's saying. And, and so here's the thing that now that we set that whole thing up, let me ask you a question. So what do you think, man? You've seen his life. It's pretty amazing. He's being used in a pretty awesome way. And uh, let me ask you a question. Should God just have left him alone? I mean, should God have just allowed him to cruise down that you know, boulevard of blessing, you know, and, you know, get the roses without thorns or maybe, you know, sticking better to that illustration, you know, no bumps in the road. Should God just have let him alone? I mean, is that what you think? Is that what we think? Isn't that what we think about our life? You know, a lot of times, Lord, I'm a good guy. I love you. I'm not perfect, but I'm in the word. I'm in prayer. I go to church. I serve, try to help poor people. And you know how it is, Lord. I mean, I've talked to a lot of you guys here and you give, you know, cash or peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. You give health and beauty aids. I mean, you name it, you know. And so, you know, you're model citizens, even in the church. And a lot of times, what is it that you want? This is what we want. We want a smooth road. Smooth sailing. I mean, I'm a good guy. I deserve it. That's kind of what I think Job was thinking. And I think if you're God and you're looking at his life, well, we just read about this guy. You're thinking, well, that's kind of what he deserves. So if you were God, would you have let him alone? And the question is, it's a hard, you know, question. But, but man, at the end of the day, the answer is no. Not if you want to go deep in your discipleship. Not if you want to be used by God more effectively and, and even greatly, you know. How, how many of you here have ever prayed that prayer, Lord, use my life? You guys ever prayed that prayer? Lord, I want you to use my life and just, I'm all yours, you know. Uh, maybe Joe prayed that prayer down the road. He ended up seeing the answer to it. If you've prayed that prayer, Lord, use me for your purposes, then you need to get ready. And we can't be surprised by the trials and troubles and tribulations and tragedies that we're going to experience in life. You know, what we have here as we're studying Job is a testimony to this truth. Think about it. Here's a man who's been used by God for thousands of years to touch billions of lives. That's him. You know, and I'm not saying, you know, I'm not making light on your trials and struggles and things that you go through. 
But you got to know, like, like Ray was mentioning earlier, Romans 8, 28, that God has the, the, the wonderful ability to take the ways of men and the, the works even of the devil, the wiles of the, the wicked one, and in his wonder, in his wonderful power, use them for good. So no matter what you're going through, you got to trust him. That's why James says to the brethren in James chapter 1, verse 2, to count it all joy when you fall into various trials. You know, uh, it's been said that a faith that's never been tested can never be trusted. And the bottom line is, and I know that, you know, I don't like pain. Most guys don't. Some girls, they can bear it more. You know, we're all different here, right? But, you know, as you're getting hit by the enemy, and it comes in different ways, doesn't it? And James is an interesting passage. It says various trials. They're not all the same. But as they come your way, he says, count it all joy. Because you will not grow unless you go through the fire. And that's what happened even to Job. You know, Job was a great man, and we've seen it in the beginning. The Lord said he's blameless and upright. He fears God. He shuns evil. But at the end, when Job really does see the Lord, he says this. He says, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now something different happens. My eye sees you. And there's something about going through the trials that brings us to that place in which we see God even more. You know, he wants to go to the past. We see that in chapter 29. And it was a great life, but God had something greater for him. And look what we read next in verse 1, the chapter 30. It says, but, but now they mock at me, men younger than I, whose fathers I, I disdain to put with the dogs of my flock. Indeed, what profit is the strength of their hands to me? Their vigor has perished. They are gaunt from want and famine, fleeing late to the wilderness, desolate and waste, who pluck mallow by the bushes and broom tree roots for their food. They were driven out from among men. They shouted at them as a thief. They had to live in the clefts of the valleys, in caves of the earth and the rocks. Among the bushes they Braid under the nettles they nestled. They were sons of fools, yes, sons of vile men. They were scourged from the land. I mean, basically, he was the greatest man. He went from being basically like the greatest man to sinking to the absolute bottom of men. You know, he talks about the children of men who were thieves and nomads and and raiders, vile, foul, nasty, disgusting, their sons are on higher ground now than him. Now, I'm not talking about the football raiders. I like the raiders. Don't I? I'm talking about what the, the Bible talks about as far as, you know, the guys that would go and they would kill and they would steal. You know, the guys that were just nomads uh, riding around. He said, now their sons are, are looking down on me. I mean... You got to see the, the way that he was way up here and then how he came way down here. Now, we use that phrase from hero to zero. That's what happened to Job. And it happens a lot in the world, but rarely to men who've done no wrong. I mean, here we see they're even singing songs about him. Look at verse 9. And now I am their taunting song. Yes, I am their byword. They abhor me. They keep far from me. They do not hesitate to spit in my face. Because he has loosed my bowstring and afflicted me. That's probably he has loosed his bowstring. That's speaking of God and just how God has shot at him with these afflictions. They have cast off restraint before me. At my right hand, the rabble arises. They push away my feet and they raise against me their ways of destruction. They break up my path. They promote my calamity. They have no helper. They come as broad breakers under the ruinous storm they roll along terrors are turned upon me they pursue my honor as the wind and my prosperity has passed like a cloud you know i don't know um if you can visualize here but it's like god's you know 
aiming, you know, as an archer at him with afflictions. And basically with that bowstring now, now, now released, there's nothing to, to hold God back. And just as God was not restraining himself in Job's eyes, he says, neither would the people. I mean, these outcasts, he said, opposed me to my face and they, they send me sprawling on the ground, knocking me down. They block my road. They do everything they can to destroy me. He said, and I have no one to help me is what he says there literally in verse 13. You know, and, and he's going through this trial. You know, and we're going to find ourselves there, you know. You know, life has a way, huh, the, the ups and the downs, huh. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, it all, it all levels out eventually. You know, but, but, you know, maybe today things are going good. Maybe tomorrow, you know, something crazy is going to happen, you know. I don't know what it's going to be like for me as a, as a pastor, as someone who cares for you guys. I just want you to be ready for we live in a fallen world and those things happen. Don't let it bring you to a place where your faith fails. Know that God will use it to make you stronger. You know, don't lose heart. Don't give up on God. And don't give in to sin. That's what you got to do. You know, and in verses 14 through 19, let me read that. Again, it says there, they come as broad breakers under the ruinous storm. They roll along. Terrors are turned upon me. They pursue my honor as the wind and my prosperity. Notice this, is passed like a cloud. I mean, just like a vapor of smoke. It's gone. And now my soul is poured out because of my plight. The days of affliction take hold of me. My bones are pierced in me at night and my gnawing pains take no rest. By great force, my garment is disfigured. It binds me about as the collar of my coat. He has cast me into the mire, and I have become like dust and ashes. You know, and a lot of guys, man, you know, they'll come to church and, and they'll say, yeah, I'm all in. You know, it's cool. I'm, you know, I'm going to you know, get baptized. I'm going to get involved in ministry. You know, I'm going to start... I'm going to start going and following the Lord. And then you know what happens, man? They get hit. They get hit. You know what happens? Can't take a punch. And they're not here anymore. And they're not serving the Lord anymore. You know, and you look at the Alvarez family, and here's their daughter, you know, 21 years old, fighting cancer. They're still serving the Lord. You look at Job and everything that he went through, man, just way up here, and now he's way down here underneath the feet of the thieves' sons. He's still serving the Lord. Even though he's struggling, he's still serving the Lord. You look at what Jesus went through and all the trials. I mean, you look at the Lord Jesus Christ, obedient to the death, and what it does, my prayer for you, is that it encourages you not to lose heart not to give up on God, not to give in to sin. I mean, he's going through, you know, pain from his skin to the very bones. I mean, on the outside, all the way to the inside, the gnawing pains. That verse 18 right there, what it talks about, what, I don't know if you guys can see it. Have you ever had somebody grab you by the collar? I remember when I was in Catholic school, I would get that a lot from the nuns. They would grab me like this, or they would grab me by my ear or whatever, you know. And uh, I don't know, what he's saying is, God, I feel like God is grabbing me by my collar. And he's just holding me up against the wall. That's what he's saying. This is how I feel. You know, in verse 19, he talks about the mire. And that's that swampy ground, that slushy mud. And where he just feels like he's sinking, right? I mean, this is where Job is. And so in verse 20, he says, here's what happens. I, I cry out to you, but you do not answer me. I stand up and, and you regard me. Or, or Literally, it means you, you, just, you just don't look at me. But, but you have become cruel to me. This is how Job is feeling. With the strength of your hand, you oppose me. You lift me up to the wind and cause me to ride on it. You spoil my success. For I know that you will bring me to death and to the house appointed for all living. I don't know, have you ever been there in that place where you're going through hard times, man? 
and you pray, and it's almost like your prayers are just bouncing off the ceiling, and you feel like God's not answering, that he's not, not, not speaking back. You know, you're, you might go through seasons like that, right? But as I mentioned to you before, even though God is sometimes silent, we need to know that he's always present no matter what you're going through. And Job mistakenly believes that, that God can't hear him or God can't see him. I don't know if you've ever felt that way. I know Israel did. Israel said in Isaiah 40, they said, why is my way hidden from you, Lord? But then when you go on and you read that passage, it says that you got to wait on the Lord. Keep walking. Keep running. If you do, keep believing then the day will come when you'll start flying. That no matter what comes your way, come hell or high water, I will serve Jesus Christ. No matter what. Well, they don't like, you know, you know, this whole religion thing. My husband, my wife, my kids, my friends, whatever it might be. Doesn't matter what they say. What do you say? Who do you say Jesus is? You serve him. No matter what comes your way, no matter what they might say, your way is not hidden from the Lord. He sees. Even though we feel that way, we know, as we read this whole story about Job, that he was perpetually in the presence of God. You know, today I was writing a little thing about Israel because I don't know if you guys know this or not, but there are some people out there in the church who believe that God is done with Israel. They call it replacement theology. And they believe that God has given up on Israel and God has replaced Israel. But the truth is, he hasn't. And you guys know they became a nation again in the last days. Man, there's going to be a, a revival there. Many of them are going to come to the Lord. God is still dealing with Israel. And that's a lesson for us because even though they fall short, so do we. Let me tell you something about your own life. Just as God didn't give up on Israel, just as God didn't replace Israel, God will not give up on you. God will not replace you. That's the God that we serve. I mean, do you guys believe that he sees you right now? He sees you. I don't know how that makes you feel. For some of you, it might make you feel a little uncomfortable, maybe convicted. For some, it's a very comforting thought. You know, here, I think Job thought that God was against him, when in all reality, the whole time, God was for him. You know, verse 23, he thought he was about to die. But we know, according to the scriptures, he lived another 140 years. So he, you know, he's thinking these things about God that aren't right. And so we read, the final verses in verse 24. Surely he would not stretch out his hand against a heap of ruins if they cry out when he destroys it. Have I not wept for him who was in trouble? Has not my soul grieved for the poor? But when I looked for good, evil came to me. And when I waited for light, then came darkness. My heart is in turmoil and cannot rest. Days of affliction confront me. I go about mourning, but not in the sun. I stand up in the assembly and cry out for help. I am a brother of jackals and a companion of ostriches. My skin grows black and falls from me. My bones burn with fever. My harp is turned to mourning and my flute to the voice of those who weep. I mean... What we find here in this section of Scripture, and I know it's kind of tough. You're like, man, that's a lot, of, that's a lot that Job's going through, you know. Um, is that the Lord, even though we go through these times where we sometimes don't understand. You know, and if you had to corner me and what, what I, what's going through my mind right now, what's going through my feelings right now. To be honest with you, man, I don't understand. I don't understand why a godly woman might get raped. I don't understand why my dad got shot in a drive-by shooting. I don't understand why he was addicted to heroin for 40 years. You know, I don't understand why my cousin got killed by the Mexican mafia. You know, he was younger, he was a good guy. I mean, you go on and on and on, and you start talking about all the things that we go through in life. 
Some of you here, I know mom's here. The son got killed in a motorcycle accident. I know one lady, her, her daughter got shot at a party, and she was not a partier. She was a good girl. She loved the Lord. She was a Christian. You know, and you wonder, why do those things happen? We live in a fallen world. We fight fallen angels. We live in fallen bodies. And God has given us a free will. But the crazy thing is that God can take all those tragedies and in his wisdom, somehow, some way, he can turn them into victories. You know, I don't know how you feel. I don't know what's going on in your life. You know, maybe one day you're going to get stripped of everything and you're going to look back and you're going to be thinking, man, the good old days. I kind of wish I could go back to those days when it seemed like everything was so smooth. Well, just in case, man, whether that happens one day or whether you're in the middle of that now, here's one thing I want to tell you in closing tonight, that no matter what you've done, no matter where you're at, no matter what's happened in the past or what's happening in the present, that God has a future for you. You guys believe that? How about that place called heaven? Is that pretty cool? That's our future, man. In Jesus Christ, if you're a Christian and given your life to him, then we have heaven. But even here, the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I mean, I know it's a verse that we always turn to, but tonight I feel like we need to close with that verse in, in Jeremiah in, in 29, 11 through 13, where God said, I, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. And then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And there were the Jews, think about it, man, they were in prison. There were the Jews bound in bondage in Babylon. I mean, it did not look good. But then Jeremiah, he, you know, he's reading this whole thing from you know, the book of Daniel. Things start to happen. And then he writes this letter. And then you know, he's telling them that God has a future for them. And even though if you were to look at their situation currently, where they were going through, it would be hard to see. But God said, you do. And you watch what happens because I'm going to start stirring up your heart. I'm going to start working, man, meddling with the middle, man. I'm going to start, you know, giving you a thirst and a hunger for righteousness. You're going to want to go to church. I mean, when you were younger, you were a drug baby because your mom dragged you to church, right? And now you're going to want to go to church, and you're going to, you're going to read your Bible, and you're going to pray, and you're going to seek me. I'm going to start stirring you up, and then you're going to start seeking me, what? With all your heart. Here's Job in the middle of this craziness. Craziness. And it didn't look good. And it might seem a long ways away, but in eight more chapters, God shows up. And it's just so cool when you read his story and know that his story, it's our story. Let me pray with you. Lord, I, I thank you for loving us, Lord, the way that you do. And Father, I just pray, Lord, as we go through this life and this world, it can be tough sometimes. But Lord, that we would know that you are working behind the scenes, even though we can't see you. We know you're there. We know you're working, Lord. And my prayer for myself, my family, this flock, my brothers and sisters, Lord, is that no matter what they go through, Lord, that they would stand strong. We don't know the future, but we know the one who holds it. And I pray, Lord, that you would work in us in such a way that we would, like Jeremiah said, seek you with all of our hearts. And Lord, if there's anyone here today uh, struggling, maybe even the, that place where they don't even know if they're a Christian, Lord, I pray, Father, that today would be the day that they would make a decision to give their life to Jesus Christ. Lord, we do love you. We thank you. Bless your people, Lord, abundantly. 
And of all these things that we've studied tonight, so many things that we can camp out on. But at the end of the day, I do pray that we would trust you. Thank you, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I'll stand up. One more song, and then we'll be dismissed. God bless you. Guess my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and He died for me, and I see His wounds, His hands, His feet, a Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. In the ancient seal by heavy stone. My sight still and all alone. The son of hell and rose again, O oh, chapel tell, where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ the King. Then on the third break of dawn, the son of hell, who rose again, O oh, chapel day, where is your sting, the angels roar, but Christ the King. In rows of white, the blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. He shall return. He shall return in rows of white. The blazing sun shall pierce the night. And I will rise among the same. My gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. the name.